Hi, Terraces. It's uh, good to have you join me for our Bible study again this week. Uh, we're continuing on with our series that we started last week on agents of reconciliation in a fractured world. And uh, we've had certainly another week of turmoil with uh, another uh, police shooting of a black person, which I think once again continues to stoke uh, some of the protests that we're seeing across the country. Uh, it's a very difficult time for our nation trying to deal with uh, racism, classism, uh, just a whole number of issues that um, have been festering under the surface for many, many years. And, um, and now they've come to the surface and it seems like it may even be uh, a long, hot summer. So so our topic, uh, once again, is trying to look at really the issue of how do we become uh, agents of reconciliation uh, in the time of turmoil and speaking into the lives of our uh, children and our grandchildren, but also struggling in our own lives of uh, what reconciliation really means and what does that look like from a biblical standpoint and also, what does that look like from uh, a practical standpoint? How do we actually carry that out in our lives? And so last week, uh, we kind of introduced uh, some definitions for uh, reconciliation and looked at some building blocks. And this week, we're going to probably look at the most central passage uh, that has to do with reconciliation in the scriptures and one that calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. And so I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint and um, and be able to work with you on that and we'll walk through it together. So <clears throat> we uh, talked last week uh, about a worldview of reconciliation. Um, and usually a worldview uh, is based more on just the horizontal side of uh, reconciliation. So the definition I gave you last week was reconciliation is basically horizontal and negotiated through conditions that are agreed upon by both parties, but the process is often controlled by the dominant party or the party that has uh, a certain leverage or power. And so it is a negotiated sort of peace or treaty or truce uh, but often tenuous and uh, does not often resolve uh, the kind of feelings that happen underneath uh, the issues that are uh, creating uh, the division and the separation between whatever parties are arguing or fighting. Uh, that is a lot different than looking at the Christian view where reconciliation is both horizontal that's between us, and I'm also vertical in terms of God. And so it brings the transcendent God uh, to intervene in both the offended party as well as the offender. Uh, so it's looking at both sides of the equation and helping us understand uh, how do we, in a sense, resolve the issues, and especially trying to implement unconditional love uh, that sets both parties free to confess truth and to be able to forgive each other. The example of this is that God reconciled us to himself in Romans 5, he tells us, um, and that while we were yet enemies. So he initiated the reconciliation on our behalf through his unconditional love, which sets us free then to say, oh, I have offended you, God. I am deeply sorry. I recognize that you gave me your son in order to take away my sin so that we can have fellowship and have eternity together. And so there's an openness then for forgiveness and be able to share the truth. And that's an important piece of this, obviously, is being able to share the truth. Some of the biblical theological views that we looked at is reconciliation is a restorative work of God by which he accepts Jesus' sacrifice for the sins of humankind to restore harmony and unity with his creation. So God created humankind, Adam and Eve, in a garden, perfect environment, a perfect relationship, and yet through disobedience of Adam and Eve, 
that relationship was broken. And as it was broken in them, every generation from then on, there's been a broken relationship. So it needs to be restored. And it was sin that broke that relationship. So therefore, we have to have someone to be able to take away our sin or some way in order to eliminate our sin so that we can have fellowship with God. So the second part of this right, uh, definition is then reconciliation is the restoration of fellowship between God and humankind based on the sacrificial payment of Christ, which satisfies the righteous demands of a holy God. So Jesus Christ was holy, he was God, and he took on flesh, but it also allows humankind to be declared righteous by placing one trust in Christ. And so he was also human. So he could be the perfect sacrifice, meeting the demands of a holy God, but then also providing a sacrifice that we might be able to have our relationship restored uh, with God. So we talked last time about three key building blocks that needed to be a part of any reconciliation that we're engaged in. And that has to do with truth and justice and love. And so we talked about the balance uh, within those three elements. So truth without love is really brutal. No one, we really don't want people to tell us, in a sense, the truth. We always want it tempered by love. So if I ask someone, how do I really look? Uh, do I really want their brutal evaluation of me or do I want it tempered by love? The same thing, truth without justice then is chaos. So when you don't have justice, then truth telling, in a sense, there's no, there's no way of really handling that. There's no way to be able to judge that. Uh, there's no way to be able to take and have the consequences of what truth might bring forth to be able to deal with that. A uh, love without truth is deception. So if I love you and I don't tell you the truth, then obviously I'm deceiving you. I'm giving you a false idea of our relationship and who we really are. And love without justice is sentimentalism. So uh, if you don't have justice with truth, then really it's just sort of a wishy-washy kind of love. It doesn't have any real substance to it and any way of really depending on it. Uh, justice without love is legalism. So we see that obviously in the scripture. And we see it today when someone is going to abide by the law without any of the spirit being part of it, it can be in a sense very damaging to relationships. And it's only, everything is just right and wrong. It's very narrow and it doesn't leave any room for any variance at all. Justice without truth is also discrimination. So if I'm the party who is in a sense handing out justice and I'm not concerned about truth, then obviously you're at my mercy and I can discriminate against you any way that I might want to do. Our, our passage today then is going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 17 uh, down through uh, 21. And I, I want to be able to read that uh, passage for us because I think it's very important and uh, we'll be building most of our observations out of that. So it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any person or any man, and it really is using a general term here, so it means mankind or humankind. So if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, now counting their trespasses against them, and he committed to them the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So it starts off and says, if there's any person who is in Christ, uh, there actually have been books written on that little phrase. What does it mean 
to be in Christ. And so as we talk about having a relationship with Christ and being within the sphere of Christ's control, giving ourselves over to Christ so that he can influence and guide and direct our lives and be the Lord of our life. And so I, I read a, a, a book by John Piper, and I, I pulled some of the things out of that book that I think helps, helps us see some of the dimensions of what it means to be in Christ. And these are all uh, scripture verses that let us know what are the benefits or what does it really mean to be in Christ. So, for instance, in Christ you were given grace before the world was created. So this was God, part of God's eternal plan. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.9, he gave us grace in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And then also in Christ you are chosen by God before the creation. So God in his infinite knowledge, uh, the whole idea of, of choosing and preordaining and all of that is a great mystery. I, I can't even begin to get into it here. But we know that God can, in a sense, choose. And so he chose us in Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, God chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. All right. So he knows the beginning from the end. He knows every one of us. He knows us by name. He, it says in the scriptures, he actually has written down in the palm of his hand. And also in Christ Jesus, you are loved by God with an inseparable love. So Romans 8, 38 and 39 are one of those great passages for us uh, to be able to really have a confidence that this love that we have in Christ cannot be broken. Uh, it says, I am sure that neither life, death or life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else of all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's that little phrase again, saying that when we are in Christ, nothing, nothing can separate us from his uncompromising love on our behalf. Also, in Christ Jesus, you were redeemed and forgiven for all your sins. Ephesians 1.7. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So, once again, we have the forgiveness of sin because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In Christ, you are justified before God, and the righteousness of God in Christ is imputed into you. So it means it's just put onto your account. It means that we are, in a sense, then clothed in Christ's righteousness. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, part of our passage today, for our sake, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him, that is in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So therefore, it restores that intimacy, that fellowship, that we can have communion with God, that we can come boldly into his presence and be able to share our life and our heart and our requests uh, with the God and our Heavenly Father. And then also in Christ Jesus, you have become a new creation and a son or daughter of God. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, Behold, the new has come. And we're going to talk about what are the old things that are passed away and what are the new things that have come. Galatians 3.26 also mentions this. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons or children of God through faith. So as we place our faith in Christ, we become part of his family. It says in the scriptures that we are actually adopted into his family. And then in Christ Jesus, you have been seated in the heavenly places, even while he lived on earth. Ephesians chapter two, chapter 2, verse 6 gives us insight into this. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
So the privilege we have, it talks about in the scriptures, especially the book of Ephesians chapter one, that we are sealed and that we have an inheritance. And so this inheritance is that we are going to rule and reign with Christ. We're going to enjoy eternity, in a sense, in his presence. So in Christ, all the promises of God are yes for you. The Second Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. It just means that these things are sure, that the promises that Christ made are they can't be broken. His character and who he is, the holy God, his name is on the line for the promises that he has made to us. So we know that they are sure. It is a yes that he's going to fulfill everything that he has promised to us. Also, in Christ Jesus, you are being sanctified and made holy. So once again, 1 Corinthians 1-2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ. Sanctification is a big word, but it also means just being made holy. That as you allow Christ to come into your life and take over and become the ruler and the leader and the guide of your life, then he leads you towards holiness. So sanctification is that as you follow Christ and you yield your life to him, he then, in a sense, brings holiness into your life and makes you a holy vessel in his sight. And then also in Christ Jesus, everything you really needed will be supplied. Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So our Heavenly Father desires to give us good gifts. He wants to pour out his love to us and guide us and direct us in this world. So as we have uh, our prayer requests, as we have needs, and we put those before God the Father, he delights in being able to answer those and provide those for us. Uh, in Christ Jesus, the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. We studied this passage when we were working in Overcomers together. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, put a garrison around your heart, will keep your heart steady, keep it from panicking, will guard your hearts and your mind. All right, so it's not just the feelings, the center of our being, but also to keep our mind stable so that we're not on a roller coaster up and down, up and down in our lives. We can have stability because we have confidence in who God is, and that peace of God comes to us as we are in Christ Jesus. And then in Christ Jesus, you have eternal life, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, or in Jesus Christ our Lord. So therefore, we have eternal life because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So in Christ, you will be raised from the dead at the coming of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, we talked about that passage not too long ago in Overcomers. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For and as Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So this means that all those united to Adam and the first humanity will die. All right, so we all are human. We're going to die. But all those united to Christ in the second new humanity, he is the second Adam. He's the one who came to be able to change what the first Adam created in terms of sin. He came to take away that sin and give us the opportunity of having life and having it more abundantly. So he says, we will rise to live again. He'll come and we will meet him in the air and we will rule and reign with him for eternity. So if we go a little bit further in our study, uh, there is what I call a transformational leap, that we are either in Christ, all right, or we're in the world. So, so this is picked up in John, and so I want to look at this passage over in John 17, and I'll pick it up at verse uh, 15, and he says, <clears throat> I do not ask you... His prayer. This is the high priestly prayer of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that he dies. All right, and it says, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, 
but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. And as you did send me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves may be sanctified in the truth. So what he's telling us here is that we are in the world, but we, we are not to be of the world. So we're not to let the world, as Romans 3, 20, uh, 3, 5, and, what is it, Romans, <laughs> it's caught me, Romans 12, 1 and 2, where he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you put that, you put that together in terms of our presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. So, so in Romans 12, we're told about not letting the world conform us into its mold. So we have to keep ourselves from the wicked one. So we found in James that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. And first we have to be willing to submit ourselves to God. He also prayed that we would be sanctified. So he's praying that the Holy Spirit would set us apart as holy vessels and that we are to be sanctified by the truth. And so that was one of the building blocks we talked about last time that it's truth, love, and justice. Well, here, the truth is what sanctifies us. So it's the relationship with the word, which is the spoken truth that God has revealed to us, but it's also a relationship to Christ, the living truth, that we are able to walk with Christ, and as we draw close to him, he continues to cleanse us and changes us as individuals. So our unity with Christ and each other convinces the world that God has sent his son. And he prays this in this prayer. Uh, he says in verse 20, I do not ask in behalf of these alone, John 17, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So he's talking to the disciples here and he's talking about the disciples and he said, I'm not just praying for the disciples, but I'm praying for all of those who believe the word or the gospel that the disciples preached down through the ages. So when you think about it, Jesus in the garden was not just praying for his disciples. He was reaching down through time and was praying for each of us individually, all right, that we would be able to be one with him. So he says, I do not ask of these be on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you have given to me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, and that the world may know that you did send me, and it's love them even as you did love me. So there's some very powerful concepts in this passage. And part of it is that the, the unity of the believers, the fact that he's reconciled us to himself. And as he prays this last prayer, and you have to think about that because a person's last words are lasting words. They're, they're very important words. And so his prayer is that there would be oneness, oneness between us and him, but also oneness between us and each other. And there's something about that unity that is powerful. So he lets us know right up front that unity of the believer is a witness to the power of Christ's redemption in the world. So the fact that he brought Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female, so you look at all of those different barriers that were broken down and that we all come together in one body. So there's something about the unity of the body and the fact that this incredible diversity of men and women of every tongue and tribe and nation, they can come together in one body, convinces the world that God has done something supernatural here, that this is unique, this doesn't happen just on its own. It happens because we have a common bond in Christ, and therefore we can set aside our differences and we can come together 
in love and unity. The unity also releases the glory of God. So when there is oneness in the church and oneness in the body of Christ, the glory of God is, can be seen. The word glory in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament has to do with weight. All right, so it says if someone has glory on them, it means there is weight to their name. The glory of God is his name has weight in the world. So as we have unity, all right, it gives weight to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says what this is about is true, that it really can bring men and women of every tongue and tribe and nation, and it can bring them together in one body. And that gives the gospel incredible weight. When the church is fractured, when the church is fighting, when the church is falling apart, the gospel of Christ has very little weight in the world because all the systems of the world are infiltrated by fighting and tension and co constant up ter turmoil in terms of what's going on in the world. So also unity produces maturity. He says there's something about unity that brings maturity. So as we learn how to be, in a sense, one with each other, that means I have to be willing to give up some of what my expectations are. You have to give up some of your expectations. So we meet together. We set aside our differences. And as you set aside your differences, then it creates glory, but it also creates maturity in you. So as a child, we want everything ourselves. We're selfish. But as you mature, you learn that as you give, as you share your toys, as you share what you have with someone else, it creates a new bond, a relationship, where there is a whole new dynamic, and we're growing because we realize that it's not just about me, it's about me thinking of others and how I can serve and be like Christ, and that's maturity. Unity in Christ also helps people to experientially know Christ. So he says right at the end of this passage that, that they might know me and that they might know you and be perfected. And so that whole idea of us experientially knowing Christ. So, so as we submit and we become one with each other, we have that sense of oneness with Christ as well. So the closer you draw to Christ, the easier it is for you to draw close to others and you can share that oneness with them. How do we get in Christ? That's the key, all right? So that's one of the things we have to consider. So we are actually baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. So in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 28, it talks about us being baptized. And especially in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, well, we've all been baptized into the body of Christ. So when we were converted, when we came to know Christ as our personal Savior, we were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. That's a spiritual baptism, all right? There's a physical baptism that happens as you're obedient to Christ. But this happened automatically. The moment you received Christ as your personal Savior, then you were baptized into the body of Christ. So baptism by the Holy Spirit makes us one with Christ and makes us one with each other positionally. We have to work that out on a personal level as we become mature and we share our lives with each other, then in a sense that oneness is developed. Baptism by the Holy Spirit also empowers us to break down the barrier of Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female. So we talked about that last week. There's, in a sense, racism, classism, and then also sexism that has to do with this passage of Scripture. And then baptism by the Holy Spirit makes us heirs of the promise. So as we're baptized by Christ, it says in, in Ephesians chapter 1, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit into the day of redemption, that we might have the inheritance and the promises of God. So that baptism is very important. It's not something we can manufacture. When you submit yourself to Christ and ask him to become your personal savior, you are automatically baptized into the body of Christ. Now, what does it mean to be then in a new creation? Because over in 2 Corinthians, it says, 
if anyone is in Christ, they become a new creation. And so another one of my favorite passages, and I've said this many times, so I have many favorite passages, but one of my favorite passages, and I think there's certain passages in Scripture that you need to really memorize, and they become foundational for you, both from a, a practical side, but a theological side. They have deep theology from them. And this is one of those passages where it says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration. That means the new birth. All right. And we're washed by the water of the word. And then he says, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So that transformation, that re-energizing by the Holy Ghost. So it means the Holy Spirit is going to come in and give transformation to our lives. So not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So these are two important pieces for us to say, this is how we become the new creation. And so then he says, well, then all things are going to pass away. So there's a transformational process. So as the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he identifies things in our lives that are in discord with our relationship with God the Father. He shows us what are the things that need to get out of our life in order for us to have a more full uh, intimacy and a more full relationship with Christ. So he's wanting to invade our lives, and as he invades our lives, there are certain things that are going to want to be pushed out or taken out of our lives, all right? So there are those old patterns, those old habits. Uh, many of them were selfish things, things that we indulged in for ourselves. We didn't think about anyone else. We didn't think about the consequences for anyone else. We simply thought, well, I really like to do this, so what do I care what happens to anyone else? I'm just going to do this on my own. So old patterns, also old thoughts. So many of us did things in the past, and once you do certain things, even like looking at pornography or if you're a gambler or whatever, there are certain thoughts that come into your mind that once again, they want to replay. So Satan wants to replay those tapes, and he wants to drag you back into that old life. And you have to say, no, 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 I've been set free from this. I don't have to go back there anymore. So we have to bring, as 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, to bring every thought into captivity into Christ Jesus. So there's a discipline. And we remember out of Philippians chapter 4, the same thing. He says, if you think on these things, the things that are holy, the things that are pure, the things that are righteous. So he gives us a whole list of things that if we discipline our minds, those old thoughts are pushed away and a whole new way of thinking starts to happen in our lives. And then old relationships. You can't you can't have those old relationships. I mean, we may hang on to some of those in terms of wanting to lead that person to Christ, but we always have to evaluate, is this relationship going to pull me back into my old way, or am I going to have to break free of this relationship and find new relationships where I can be able to be part of who Christ is and be part of the body of Christ? So, so old relationships sometimes have to go. So what are the new things that are, will come? Well, new life. Um, there's abundant life in Christ. Uh, he gives us a new spirit. So that means the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us. Uh, there's new power. He says there's resurrection power. We talked about this word some time ago. It's dunamis. It means it's the explosive power that sets us free that gives us power over sin and death and Satan, all right? He gives us new insight. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, where he talks about how he illumines us. He illumines our eyes. He guides us in to all truth. So there's illumination where we see things. So as I'm studying the Word of God, the Holy Spirit illumines the Word of God, and I see new things, new truth that I had never seen before. So some of you, like me, have been studying the scripture for 60 years. And I still, as I go through the word of God, 
I find brand new things I've never seen before. What is that? That is illumination. That is God shining a light on a passage of scripture, shining that same light on my heart, showing me that I need to change. I need to transform. I need to be willing to follow him. So that's that illumination. New strength, the ability to bring every thought into obedience to Christ. And also a new vision, to start realizing that all that God wants me to be. So really, when we were in sin, when before we came to know Christ, we were actually slaves to that thing. Even Paul mentions that. The things that I don't want to do, I do. The things that I do want to do, I don't do. All right? So he says, you can be set free from that. So as you allow the Holy Spirit to give you that power, as you follow Christ in obedience, then you're able to break those things and you start to become what God really has designed you to be. And then a new passion. We have a love for Christ. And so once again, that's, that's our relationship over the long haul. Each time we're growing more and more in love with Christ, giving him control, trusting him in all of the things that have to do in terms of the guidance and the living out of our lives. So he says in this passage also in 2 Corinthians, and I'll just go back and read that for you again. He says that he has given us a word of reconciliation in verse 18 and 19. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So God reconciled us to himself. All these things are from God. That's the way he starts this passage. So God is the source of reconciliation, not humankind. We did not initiate it. We would have never thought about it in a million years. But God in his great love reconciled us while we were still sinners. Then God is the creator of the world and the human race, which was very good. However, humanity fell in sin and became separated from God. So God is the initiator. He reconciled the world to himself. And God is the creator of the new creation, a new world order, which is called the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom that's based on righteousness and justice and love and holiness and truth. And we could go on and on with many, many other adjectives along the word. So, so the kingdom of God is the most powerful kingdom that overcame Satan. And as we look forward to it, the same thing as the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. We're going to rule and reign with Christ where there will be peace. There will not be violence. There won't be sickness. We talked about this when we were looking at our course together on heaven that it's going to be a place where all of those things are gone and we will live forever in eternity with him. So God reconciled us through Christ. And this is the passage that I call the great exchange. Uh, he says it right at the end of this. He made him, verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he who knew no sin, that Christ was purity, he was truth. There's no darkness in him. There's no variance in him. Uh, everything that he is about is truth. All right, so when you bump into Christ, he reflects the truth of who you are. And you see your shortcomings. You see where you need to change. So he is that standard of truth in the world. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, all right? So, and he was made sin for us. So this is a very uh, difficult uh, passage. Uh, and when did this happen? Well, I believe it happened on the cross. Uh, we know of Christ's agony on the cross. And when Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What he's saying there is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
That's, that startles me when I hear that. Somewhere there's a break between the Father and the Son. And I believe at that moment that the sin of the world was placed on Christ. And as the sin of the world was placed on Christ, it created that sense of separation between Father and Son. God cannot look on sin. All right, so he cries us out. But he also says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So as he takes on the sin of the world, he turns himself over to God, and God accepts him as the sacrifice for that sin. So I believe this happened on the cross, that he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you think about that for a few minutes, it's, it's almost overwhelming. Here is a pure vessel never experienced sin, and now you take and pour the sins of the world, all of the ugliness, all of the nastiness of sin of the world, and pour that into a holy vessel. What an agony that must be. Even Christ, when he prayed in the garden just before the crucifixion, he says, Father, take this cup from me, he knew what he was going to have to drink. He knew what that would be like. But he says, Father, not my will, but your will. So, so there's that great exchange. This very Son of God, who is perfectly holy, takes our sin and makes himself the sacrifice, the final Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why? that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So there's that justice. All right, he declares us righteous so we can have fellowship with him. We're restored in our relationship. We become part of his family. So God was not only in Christ reconcile us, but he was in Christ reconciling the world. And it says in this passage, not counting their trespasses against them. So God extends grace to the world. If God were to judge the world on an immediate basis, the world would be wiped out. It's only by God's grace that he allows us to live, and he allows us to live even in our sinfulness, even in rebellion. And there are people who will never, never receive Christ as their personal Savior, and yet his grace is extended to them. So you just think about that, the great love of Christ and extending his grace into the world. Otherwise, the world would be judged and we would see the wrath of God displayed within the world. And he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. That is, that forgiveness brings restoration. So if you will submit yourself to Christ, forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness, will restore your relationship to God. And therefore, you can be part of the family of God, the children of God. And then he has chosen to accomplish his purposes through us. So he sent his son as the first ambassador. His disciples were those ambassadors down through the ages. And now we and our generation are those ambassadors as well. That we are ambassadors of and it's the reconciliation of God. So, ambassadors, what does that really mean? So it's from the same word as elder, presbyteral, uh, presbyter. We hear that in the Presbyterian Church. It means someone who's not a novice, someone who is seasoned in the word and mature in their faith. So to become an ambassador of reconciliation means you need to grow and we need to grow in our Christian lives to where we have a measure of stability. So as we're trying to enter into reconciliation, we have to understand something about truth and love and justice and how God is at work in every one of those values and that we bring those kind of values to the situation that needs to be reconciled. So we're commissioned as a sovereign power. That was what an ambassador was. We 
gave you a question on that, and I'm interested to know uh, what country would you like to be an ambassador to and why, and what would that really mean? So an ambassador is one who represents a foreign power. So we really represents the kingdom of God, which is come and resides in the world, but it's not of the world, all right? And it's a kingdom that's going to overcome the world, all right? So we're representatives of that kingdom, and we preach that kingdom that it is about love and justice and holiness and righteousness. That's what we have. That's our message. And then it represents the sovereign with all the power of the king. So it means we have the total power of Christ behind us, the whole power of the Holy Spirit behind us. So as we go out, we're not doing this on our own strength, but as we are rely on Christ, his power works through us to bring about the kind of transformation that we might not even ever think would happen. There are those times in my life when I've been witnessing to someone and I, I would never have thought they would ever come to know Christ. There was a doubt on my part, but it was amazing how God's power intervened in that and drew that person to Christ, and they were able to come to know Christ as their personal Savior. So no matter who God leads on your heart, even though you might have your own doubts, even though you might think this cannot happen, God's power is transformational, and it can accomplish you know, what it's sent out to do. Ambassadors must display the character and the integrity of the sovereign power. So our lives and how we live our lives, all right, is important because we become, in a sense, that model. So if we're up and down in our lives, we're not living the Christian life properly, then obviously who's going to believe our word and how do they know that we've really been reconciled to God? Ambassadors are guaranteed results based on the sovereign power, not our power. So once again, it brings that into play that it's not us convincing. It's not me playing a game of chess with someone to get him into the kingdom of God. It's allowing, just sharing the truth of God's word, sharing the love of Christ, and demonstrating God's justice in this world convinces people that, wow, this is the real thing. I need to believe this. I need to accept this. The sovereign God wants to speak through us. We are his vehicles through whom the Holy Spirit convinces the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So we have the privilege of sharing the word of God and letting the Holy Spirit then be able to convince the world to draw them to Christ. So the ministry of reconciliation, calling all men and women to be reconciled to God, that's our mission out in this world, calling men and women to be reconciled to each other. And that's the, what we face today. We see the turmoil that's around us. And so we might not be able to have a voice into the big picture, but every one of us have a sphere of influence. And you'd be surprised how big that sphere of influence is. Friends, neighbors, family, all kinds of interconnection networks that we're a part of. So we do, we have an opportunity to bring together that sense of reconciliation, making clear the great exchange that Jesus who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf that we might be reconciled to God. So that's part of what we're sharing. Also making clear that God is willing to wipe the debt card clean by receiving Christ as a personal savior. So forgiveness takes away individual sin and we are reconciled to God and we are justified. He places his righteousness on us and making clear that when you receive Christ, you are a new creation. So what are some of the tools we might have? Well, these are some that I've used and I think they might be helpful to you. Uh, there's the Timothy program that's by CBMC, uh, the Christian Businessmen's Connection. They're available here in uh, Fresno area. You just call the CBMC office. They have people who will train you in the Timothy program. It's a series of about 12 lessons that you take a person through. They fill in the blanks. You meet with them once a week. Uh, you discuss the passages of scripture with them. I've taken many people through. It's been an incredible tool to see uh, Christ um, revealed in someone's life and for them to come to know Christ as their Savior. Uh, Greg Laurie also has the Believer's Bible, which is another very powerful tool, and it has 
a numerical system in there that if you follow in the outline of the book, then it can help you lead a person and it raises questions. And the nice thing about it, it's all done in the Bible. So you have a Bible, he's working with his Bible, you're working with your Bible. And so therefore you're helping them understand the scriptures and you're leading them through a process that they can help them understand who Christ is and what he's done for them in their lives. Now also how to have peace with God, uh, Billy Graham's. It's a little track and a booklet. And once again, it's been very powerful. It's been used in all of his uh, rallies and his crusades along the way. And so I'd encourage you to think about that. And then we have here in Fresno a very unique program, VORP, which is a victim offender reconciliation program. Uh, I've been through their training and done some of that, both in terms of uh, in the church with individuals or actually been in churches where there's been conflict and help them resolve those conflicts. So you can contact VORP uh, through Fresno Pacific University or it's listed. Uh, I think I gave you a, uh, a email address for it so that you can look it up on your own. So what are the, some of the takeaways? Well, our position in Christ is, base, is the basis from which reconciliation flows from us to the world. So that little phrase in Christ that we went through with you. And that's a great thing to go back and just remind yourself what it means to be in Christ. When Satan wants to kind of draw you away, create doubt in your mind, you can say, no, I'm in Christ and here's all the things that God has done in my behalf. We have, const have to constantly remind ourselves that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. So once again, Romans in terms of chapter 12, 1 and 2, you need to look at that and say, hey, I, I'm not going to be conformed to this world. I'm going to offer myself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. And then becoming the new creation involves the washing of regeneration and the new birth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So once again, that, that understanding that what has happened in our lives and how we actually became part of that new creation, that God wants to remove the old and he wants to bring transformation uh, through the Holy Spirit. God is the source of reconciliation, not humankind. He initiated it. He has called us to join him in his process of reconciling the world to himself. And we uh, were reconciled to God by the great exchange. So Jesus became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I think we need to remember that passage because it tells us the price that was paid, that we were able to be reconciled to God. And then as ambassadors for reconciliation to the world, we are to call men and women to consider Christ, you know, who is the savior of the world. So I would encourage you to uh, join me at five o'clock for our Zoom discussion. Uh, we had a great time last week. Um, there's not a lot of people who are joining in, eight or ten of us, uh, but it's a great time to discuss some of your insights from the Word of God that you've seen that I haven't seen, and then also to be able to just answer the questions and uh, deal with what we found in the Scriptures together. So, so join me at, um, at the Zoom conference, and uh, we'd be glad to be able to share together and to discern what God wants us to do in reconciliation.